Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Learning Salon. Um, it's a really um, an honor and a delight to have Adrian Fairhall here to speak to us today. Uh, I can't be fully objective because Adrian's a wonderful friend and uh, I've talked with her about everything, including neuroscience. Um, but she is a very deep thinker and is very well situated because she has her finger on the pulse of many cross currents in neuroscience, um, being involved in the Connectome project, having connections to you know, Allen Institute, because she's based in Seattle. She's a university professor um, at, in the Department of Physiology at the University of Washington, Seattle. And so is uniquely uh, situated, I think, both geographically and intellectually to talk about the big topics uh, we're going to be talking about today. Um, so it's uh, great to have you here, Adrian, and take it away. Thank you. Let me see if I can solve the problem of showing my screen. Uh, window. Okay, does this work? Interview mode. Um, so, okay, so uh, where I thought I would go today, you know, when John asked me to do this last week, I was like, Ooh. I don't have some polemical argument that I want to make or trash anybody here, but um, so I, you know, I don't want to bloviate, but then the title that occurred to me to give you is understanding the brain, which might, you know, um, not sound all that modest, but what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit through um, frameworks that we have for, for understanding the brain and biology in general and see where we're at with that. And you know, part of part of where we want to go today is through um, a job I had uh, last year and the year before of being part of the uh, the committee that was established to review the Brain Initiative. So I'm going to show you a few things as well from uh, the original Brain Initiative um, call to for for action, and just remind you. You know, I know a lot of you are from the theoretical and computational neuroscience community. What it is we're meant to be doing, and it's a lot. And so just um, I think it's a good time to think about you know where we're at with that and what are the methods that we're using and how we're going about it. All right, so what does it mean to understand a system? So those of you who came to Conrad's uh, talk uh, last week, will you know he framed our inability potentially to use the methods that we have in neuroscience to understand something that we know computes, you know, a microprocessor, for example. The tools that we have at our disposal are theory, modeling, and data analysis, and so. Uh, in the little paper that that um, Josh sent around or uh, posted that that I wrote a couple of years ago for um, current opinions, I framed you know what I the way I think about what understanding means, and I you know I think I want to throw it up here both for discussion and for uh, for debate. And so to me, fully understanding a system means kind of having all of these pieces. And I know this this very much um, you know has. Uh, shades of, of Mars hierarchy, but I, I just want to take it from my own point of view and um, talk it through. Right All right, so, I just wanted to say, do you, uh, is the screen supposed to be black? No, it's not. Uh, so you we are only going to be on the screen right now. Okay, have you seen any slides? Mm. Not yet, not yet. Just, okay, I'm back to the main. So, um, why is it black? Interesting. Let me see what okay, I'll close that. Let's try sharing again. Share screen. Select. I selected my slideshow to share. And so does that does that work now? Yes. All right. You have a picture, right? With <laughs> good. So um three pieces to fully understand what biological systems are computing. One, computation, right? What's the algorithm? Uh, what we're doing when we're recording data is we're getting a high dimensional description in terms of data or alternatively of a, some high dimensional model, which would be the Marian kind of implementation. And to me as a physicist, you know, the key piece that I feel like physicists um, want to contribute is this final, you know, leg of the, of the triangle where we're trying to take that high dimensional understanding or, or observations and 
squeeze from it some low dimensional model that captures whatever is the fundamental sort of mechanistic um, implementation of that high level computation. And for me, this is a picture that, that really helps me at least to frame what it is that different people are bringing to the table when we're trying to interact, you know, to study the brain, you know, computation. You know, when John um, tells us that he wants to see more behavior, I think this is really the level that John is, is thinking at, you know, what's the system actually doing and what are kind of the high level models, computational models that explain what the, what the guy is doing. Then our experimental friends want to put in thousands of electrodes into the brain and, and see what that means from the implementation side. And the rest of us would like to take that and squeeze it down into some, you know, model that we can actually write down, right, in close form and say that is what we think the computation is in terms of, you know, a, a, a piece of math. And so where, uh, you know, so how are we doing, right, with, with all of this, you know, these different transitions, right, from computation to model, tells about implementation, it tells about fundamental mechanism. It's really, this is a very interesting, I think, leg, the high dimensional to low dimensional model, and one in which maybe um, we have perhaps the weakest um, um, set of tools to, to work with at the moment. All right, so blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to throw up, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this and a couple of other, other avenues, and I think it's actually interesting and useful to try to remind ourselves, you know, what theory has contributed to neuroscience. You know, I've certainly been at cocktail parties with people like Winfred Danks, or, you know, what did the theorists ever do for us? And, uh, you know, the roads, aqueducts, you know, there is actually quite a lot that um, has been contributed. Hebbian learning was a theoretical idea before, um, before we saw it ever in data, hierarchical sensory representations, motion detection, blah, 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 right? So there's a lot that has been formulated from the kind of a priori idea of how the brain might work that has framed questions that could be then searched for in neuroscience. And that is um, a super important part of, of how it all works. So last week, um, we had a bit of, of um, I'd say complaining. <laughs> uh, a lot of people lately have been very negative about, about tuning cards and receptors. You know, this is a big part, I'd say, of what neuroscience, um, particularly computational or, or theoretical neuroscience, sort of thought it was about um, for a while is sort of how do we represent information in spikes in terms of um, tuning curves and receptive fields. And understandably, in particular, people from the motor system have been um, very critical of that, of that perspective recently, partly because the way tuning curves have been thought about in the motor system I'd say is a bit behind the eight ball um, with re relative to, to say sensory people in that it's generally sort of a curve right, that tells you how the firing rate depends on some externally uh, measured parameter. But I, you know, I, I feel like that's a little unfair and that's partly because um, the brain is a physical system, right? So it's an overlaid series of multiple physical mechanisms going all the way down to sensory transduction through plus there's any mechanisms up to global network function. And as physicists, what we try to do is describe systems like this. So the system operates on its input to generate some output. And pretty much any physical system should be able to be written down, you know, roughly speaking like that. And uh, what we are trying to do when we simplify or, or extract the, the function of a physical system is to rewrite this, you know, in this form. So the output or, um, uh, is can be written as a uh, as a Green's function, right? Some some uh, kernel operating over over f of s, and so that to me uh, is a much better way to think about what we're what we're trying to express when we think about what a receptive field is. And in, in a lot of my work, you know, starting with Bill Bialik and others, I think you know many of us in particularly working in sensory systems, have really tried to broaden out um, the perspective that people have about what a tuning cover or receptive field is to mean this, right? To mean the kernel through which inputs are transformed into outputs. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean the inputs in terms of something outside in the outside world turning into neural activity. It could also be some neural state being transformed into to some other neural state. And so to me, there's not really a dichotomy between the idea of expressing things in terms of tuning curves, generalized to mean, right, a, a 
complex spatiotemporal uh, receptive field and thinking about things in terms of dynamical systems because a dynamical system can be converted to into this in this form generally at least if we can linearize it right if things are non-linear it's always more complicated but that means dressing it up right so i've written glm here without the without the the g part of of the linear model we just get something straightforward you know this kind of convolution if it's non-linear we have to you know use um clever advanced methods right to figure out how to incorporate non-linearity and that's why we are friends with applied mathematicians who can help us to kind of push that that field along and the brain fundamentally is a physical object right it's different than your neural network simulation because it has properties that are fundamentally based in the fact that it's bits of matter connected to other bits of matter you know waves propagate through the brain i remember the first time i saw um Carl Peterson, you know, show that when he stimulated one whisker and he looked, you know, at that calcium activity in the brain, you would just see this propagating wave of activity that wasn't respecting barrel boundaries, wasn't respecting functional barriers at all, just moving right through the brain. And so these properties are being overlaid on whatever, uh, whatever computation we think the brain is doing. I put oscillations here, that's maybe a bit more controversial, but I, I think it's unclear what oscillations are, are doing in terms of their contributions to uh, to computation and it's there's lots of interesting ideas but they arise because the brain again is a, is a physical system that you have different um, types of neurons that are talking to one another that end up generating this sort of emergent behavior of, of oscillations and so that again is not something that's showing up in anyone's deep neural network all right, so let me just remind you, you know, what our mandate was as a theoretical community from, from the Brain Initiative. So, you know, a lot of people sort of characterize the Brain Initiative as being all about tool development, but really uh, a lot of stress was put on the contribution of, of theory, modeling, and data analysis. You know, scientific goal produced conceptual foundations for understanding the biological basis of mental processes through development of new theoretical and data analysis tools. So there's lots of things, I'm gonna just summarize them quickly. We need lots of new data analysis techniques, right? To understand non-stationary processes, to scale up data analysis, me analysis methods to large populations. Where do brain rhythms come from? How do we think about functional connectivity? How do we combine information across scales? Uh, blah, 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 you see, you know, this is scary, right? This is what, what our goal was, 10 year goal, and we're already six years in. Bridging from components to function, how do neural codes of dynamics support behavior, plasticity mechanisms, the learning theories of motor action, information routing through the brain, internal brain states, decision making, goal directed behavior. You know, this is this is everything. And there have been, you know, huge successes uh, from the data analysis side, some successes in thinking about multi scale methods and fundamental principles. Quickly review what they are, right? So everyone is um, blissfully aware, I hope, of, of all these cool new tools that are letting us extract connectomes, are letting us do um, high throughput calcium imaging, um, high throughput spike sorting, and beautiful complex um, analysis of, of behavior. Also come a long way with data analysis. We're no longer you know, building receptive fields like this. We are thinking about uh, how that how that drives entire populations and so we've got you know all the way up to things like these sort of LFADS models that take populations of neurons and and extract you know use by using data sort of complicated um, um, sets of, of complicated network models that allow us to you know understand sort of trial by trial variability multi-scale methods won't talk about that um, fundamental principles where are we at with that networks are you know not models are an enormous um piece of that and the progress that's been made in the last few years is really uh, impressive so we've gone from feed forward to our networks to deep networks that lets us do you know what uh, why fair likes to call artiphysiology right we can go in and look at responses of, of neurons within the network and ask how that how that whether that maps onto uh, things that we see in the brain using recurrent networks, going back to the ideas of, of hot fields, you know, that there were these very nice ideas that memory might be stored as sort of discrete attractors in attractor networks. Obviously, the space of attractor solutions is much richer than that. Um, and indeed, we're starting to see in data, right, that there are um, neural systems that, that do have the 
dynamics of, of those attractive solutions. But I think what's been really, uh, what we all would agree has been kind of revelatory is what one can do uh, with network models that don't necessarily are, uh, express a particular attractor solution, right? So we can use um, network models of the type that, that Kamek has worked on to, to fit complex patterns of neural activity. And you know, this really uh, insightful work from Valerio Monte where, where they trained uh, ANN to perform a task and then the beauty of that is that you can go into your train network and try to understand the, you know, the computation that has been embedded in that, in that high dimensional network in terms of its attractor structure. Um, we've walked, talked already about these more data driven variants of that. All right, so where are we at with this picture? Um, what, have the, what has the development of artificial neural network models and the ability to train them to do really impressive things uh, where has it taken us to? So I guess um, to me, what it's sort of done is replace this picture a little bit with a different one, which is to say, you know, we define maybe not the computation, but the task, and we measure you know, recordings of an animal doing that task, and then we build a neural network to do that same task. And what we're hoping to find is some common and low dimensional structure between the train network and the, the true instantiation in data that will then reveal to us uh, what that computation is, right? And like, maybe this is a little bit where, where John's complaint arises is, you know, how do we do that, right? So we see this common low dimensional structure and now we kind of have to map that onto the computation. That, I think, how, how, that, how that works is, um, is still a bit of a, an open question of, of how to do it appropriately and whether whether something like you know reinforcement learning paradigm that we may think that the brain is doing can really um, sort of drop out of data analysis uh, in that way. All right, so where to from now? Obviously, everyone's using complex um, behavior, which is awesome. Uh, we have closed loop read write protocols, which lets us go further than just using data analysis to do. And to do correlation, we can now do perturbation, which is a, a huge step forward in, a bit in our ability to test uh, our models. There's a lot of very nice um, theoretical neuroscience going on with respect to trying to bridge from the connectome to dynamics. You know, connectome is, is an amazing new source of information. How do we, how do we use it? And so people like Archie Brown um, and Ellie Schlitzerman at UW have been doing some very nice work in thinking about how motifs within, within a connectome can translate into telling us information about the transfer you know, properties of, of the network. And even in this case, being able to predict what are the dynamical modes of say C elegans. What are we missing? Uh, we are you know, getting a lot of information now about cell types. Cell types obviously, as we're seeing, play different roles in microcircuits. Biophysics contributes multiple time scales and distinct um, intrinsic plasticity mechanisms and are differentially modulatable, right? So neurotransmitters and neuropeptides aren't something we put in our, our neural network models. They act on longer spatial and temporal scales, can dramatically influence um, neuronal and synaptic properties. And you know, there's this wonderful paper that some of you might have seen from um, Stephen Smith at the Allen Institute um, from earlier this year where uh, it's becoming clear that there is a whole other right, connectome which is written on top of, of the one that we're, we're currently extracting with, with all the cool uh, techniques, which is that of the way that cells communicate with one another using neuropeptides and neuromodulators. You know, those seem to be cell type specific and there's this whole additional kind of connectome laid on top that hopefully we can figure out right, how to build into our models. So what are we missing in terms of our current theories? I think we still really don't get um, plasticity mechanism. That's clear. Glia, we also don't, according to models, very few people are, are really um, taking that seriously from a theory point of view. And this lovely work from Misha Arendt earlier, um, this year or last year shows you know, that glia really do um, carry important information about, about decisions. Uh, we don't really understand the interaction of computation as we as we implemented in, in neural network models with these sort of gross physical properties of waves and, and oscillations. Uh, electrical coupling, gap junctions are, are kind of everywhere. They're not also 
things that we incorporate in our models, chemical communication, as we just mentioned. I feel like control theory is another area where there are a few people doing very nice work, but it's obviously um, very important right now that we've come to the point of being able to, to um, stimulate networks in, in real time. And I feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done in developing control theory to move it beyond sort of linear, um, linear regimes. We have been struggling for a billion years with thinking about good theories of um, collective or emergent you know, properties. Um, are there alternatives to thinking about cost function and optimization as the only way for networks to, to change and to learn? You know, what's the role of state? What's the role of emotion? Um, that I think we're, we're a little bit sort of hemmed in to uh, a little bit narrow ways of thinking about, about plus system and learning. And I'm sure many of you out there have other guesses for you know, what we don't know that we don't know, and that might be uh, super important for us uh, going forward. So that's all I wanted to say, so just remind you, you know, though, oh yeah, that was just a quote from Yuri here. Um, remind you that um, although, you know, that we've had great progress in building neural networks that both reproduce data and that can solve tasks in similar ways to animals, there are lots of aspects of the, of the real brain right, that, that are not incorporated in those models and that are super important for us to understand because the only way we have of, of manipulating our real brain is with, with the chemicals at the moment right, that control a lot of these properties. And so if we want to be relevant to, say, human health, the dials that we have at the moment until we really uh, realize the the dreams of the brain initiative and are able to address individual neurons in order to you know change change dynamics are at the level of um, of chemicals right of molecules that that are involved in plasticity and neuromodulation so we have I think our theories really have the responsibility to try to interface with the dials that we have um, clinically anyway I'll stop there and open it up for for discussion wait let me share. Thank you so much. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, before we go forward, I want to remind everyone that if they don't understand a term, if it's uh, something outside of their field, they should feel free to ask a question. And uh, if they ask a question using the ask a question, then people can vote. If they ask a question in chat, Kanaka and Brad will answer or they will amplify your questions so that you can ask that. There, there are no silly questions. If you need a clarification, if you don't know what a term means, if a slide had too many things you want to go back to it, feel free to ask. And with that, I'm, I'm just going to um, open the sort of podium first for the three of us to ask a couple of questions. And then we're going to go to ask a question, give a little bit of time to people to add more questions there and vote. And yeah, and Kanaka and Brad, please let me know if somebody has a clarification question. Yeah, and I hope people didn't take too seriously the idea you have to sort of get all the figures on the slides. They were really more um, to direct my my flow of thinking through the through the stuff. It was nothing on a slide in a picture that you really have to to follow. More just broad picture. All right, John, at me. <laughs> Oh, you are muted. Good to see you a lot. So I, so I, you know, Adrian, we did send out, we did um, read your, you know, long live the receptive field paper. Um, and the way I was reading it was that the kind of diagram that you started with, you kind of first constructed that diagram thinking at the level of single neurons. Um, and then, we kind of thought amongst ourselves that one could take an analogous view at the level of populations and higher level cognitive phenomena, which means that you were saying you can take the framework from neurons to populations, which seems a little different to thinking that we need to know all the level of detail biophysically at the level of single neurons yeah, so I, when I, I, one gets, so which, which one was it? Do you see what I'm yeah, saying? Let me push back on that idea that it was developed from the single neuron point of view. Yeah, I, I, in that paper, I went through the example of adaptation as a case where we could fill in all the boxes more or less, but definitely I think we would put that framework out um, not specifically to map onto single neurons. It just happened that that's one case that I've done that, that I felt like I, I could actually put something 
in each of those in each of those parts. You know, when we think about adaptation, the computation that was formulated, you know, by Balo and then by, by Bialik and others is that neurons are doing efficient coding. So that makes a particular prediction for how the receptive fields and the nonlinearity should change in time or, or as a result of, of the stimulus. So you know, that encapsulates what the computational principle or goal is. We can find an instantiation of that in a, in a biophysically based model, and then we can try and strip that down to figure out what it is about that biophysical system that lets it do the computation. So it was an example, uh, an illustration of where one could hopefully fill in all the boxes, but ideally one would really like to see this applied much more generally. And I, you know, I, I think a lot of the anxieties that people um, express about, <clears throat> about neuroscience right, are, are because we're not kind of getting at one or the other of those things. You know, one of, one of my anxieties, for example, <laughs> is that um, what if it is all just huge high dimensional neural networks and that's the answer, right? So we look at what Google's doing with AI, they fitting bazillion parameter high dimensional neural systems, they're amazing and do all kinds of cool stuff. And we can look at the, you know, at the pieces, right? The, the perceptron type, you know, pieces, and then you need to add LSTMs, right? To give it, give it long time scale dynamics and say that that gives us some clue about what um, biological elements might be doing in adding those those characteristics to the network but in the end it's just a super high dimensional neural and, and you know how do we understand that right so is it enough to say well i can capture it with a model with these pieces and this kind of architecture and that can be trained to do what the real brain does or is there an opportunity to do i think what drew many of us into the field is that there exists that you know low dimensional model there exists that level of understanding that's not simply taking a very complex system and reproducing it with another very complex system and saying i'm done right but so that's to me why then, why what that picture is about is my my dream right <laughs> that we right. might to add so, that. In other words, so if i understand you adrian what you're suggesting is that if it were just high dimensional data plus low dimensional models and simulation and mimicry it, it sounds like what you're saying in a sort of wistful way is it'd be nice if, it, if the biophysics, the physics, as you say in that paper, did matter. So it seems to me that you're torn between the possibility that we'll understand at a level of abstraction can, that can abstract away from the biophysics, which is more likely to happen in my view, the, the more cognitive and the more population-based you get, the more abstract you can get in your explanatory objects. But you seem to be thinking, well, maybe we can have our cake and eat it and get all biophysical and detailed on it at the implementation level and have both types of explanation. Is that fair or is it something you're willing to give up? Not so much willing to give up is just that I worry that the kinds of models we're building um, are forgetting, you know, big pieces of what of the capabilities, right, that the biophysics is giving us. That is neuromodulation, these things that can sort of dynamically change the nature of the network using a whole other layer, right, of, 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 of control, right, through, through, through chemicals. And so presumably one can, um, you know, expand out your, your, you know, a neural network is an arbitrary function fitter. So you can just add more of your bonehead neurons that don't do all those things and hopefully capture that. But maybe there are more efficient ways to do it. If we think about smarter ways to build our neural network models that have the, the cool, you know, capabilities that, that we see happening at that. So my, my last client for the others is your Nico Krieger's quarter. Um, said to me once, sort of a along the lines of what you're saying, which is start with something that's a little bit abstract, like a neural network model, see what you can do with the architecture and the learning algorithm, and then be ready to peruse your library of Alexandria with all the neural details and be willing to add them when you realize you can't do without them. But start fairly abstract. And then if you need to borrow biophysical details and glia, God forbid, do so when you can't get away with the abstract architecture. Um, and so have it at hand if necessary. But I do think that's different from saying that you're going to bottom up the answer. From yeah, no, I, I don't think 
it's right to say, but if we're going to build these large scale networks at all, you know, that is a great approach is to start as simple as possible and add. If we're going to try to use them to understand what the biological mechanisms are doing, we may want to go about that in a different way, right? If you are a, um, um, a person that wants to solve depression and you're, you're giving your patients, right, some kind of, of drug, you know, what's it doing, right? You're not going to get that from your neural network model unless you have some kind of way in which, which that drug can manipulate your network model in a similar way. And maybe there's an abstract level at which a, a trained network can kind of have that control knob implemented in a completely different way through some kind of, you know, module, right? But, but it won't help us to, to do the mapping that we need to be able to treat people. There's I would just say, you know, fixing, fixing and understanding are a little bit different as a project, it seems to me. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So maybe Josh, Ida. One thing that I wanted to say to the start, for instance, the neural network idea even, something that uh, in, the, in the review that you had, you had the analytic approach and then the statistical data, data approach. And it seemed like the analytic approach could be some model, some low dimensional latent space, and then we think about what's happening there. If there is a mapping, like for instance, some mapping to prefrontal representations that happens to come from the data side as well, great. But if not, we still learn something, we can still test something. Um, I, I was a little surprised that it was mostly focused on neural network approaches because um, there are obviously other approaches. And one thing that I wanted to ask you about that before I go to my second question, which I will ask after maybe uh, if Joshua wants to ask this question first. Um, the thing that I wanted to ask you now is perturbation on that low D models that you have. You didn't, I, I didn't notice that as much highlighted in that paper. But for instance, let's say neural networks or convolutional neural networks as a model of the visual system. If you look at adversarial attacks on the convolutional networks, uh, the behavior doesn't look like the adversarial attacks on humans. So it seems like something is different. Mm -hmm. A couple of recent papers uh, by Irina Rich, who's now at uh, Montreal and other people um, have tried to find some solutions to this. Some people try to figure out if they can design adversarial attacks on humans using these networks. Other mm -hmm. people thought, oh, what if we add attention? Turns out you need the fovea and attention to improve the performance of the neural network. So it started with the neural network, but it actually went even higher level, implementing another high level thing, which was attention not right. more low level in order to overcome the challenges that it had. Mm -hmm. And I think that that idea, uh, I think is something that um, I found that it wasn't as much highlighted, that sometimes you start at some kind of a high level, but you realize you need more high level things to even get the behavioral predictions right. right. Uh, you don't even need to go further down as much, but uh, implement more high level ideas even. So that's one thing that I wanted to highlight before we, I ask the second question. Yeah, I guess I deeply don't believe that computation, that, that convolutional neural networks do work like the visual system. So, you know, the fact that they don't respond in the same way to adversarial attacks, but you can always change something about your, your CNN to make it kind of behave more like the way humans do. I, you know, I, you know it's triviality. We, we all talk about these things all the time, but, you know, the fact that there's so much feedback connection coming in and that the amount of information that we take from our fovea is so low res and so tiny, right? We are constructing this amazing veridical representation of the world. I feel like I'm seeing everything around me, right, in high res. And that is not, nothing to do with the, the actual patterns on my, my photons because I'm getting such a tiny, you know, pinhole in the world through my fovea. And so what we're living in, as we, we all talk about it, is actually an internally constructed reality of which that little bit of visual information is a kind of refresher, right? That, that keeps that world sort of focused, right? And I, I, I feel like we, that's not what a convolutional neural network does. And we're, we're just so far from, from having network models that really build an internal world and let us manipulate it and walk around in it and, you know, step it out five steps as I walking down the road as a mother and, you know, you see a car and every mother knows this, right? You see that car plunging off the road and running over your child, you know, you're just projecting constantly dangers and horrible things and in your mind's eye, right? So that is something that, that we don't 
have a computational structure for yet, really. Trevor, did you want to go first before I follow? Because I'm not, I, I feel like you, you gave a great answer to a different question than what I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I will give Joe an opportunity to 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 sort of maybe he had a point to make before I go on and ask another. Oh, you went up live. I hope his okay. laptop is. I'm here. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, you're I here. But not see you. We can't, can't see you. I think your camera went down. And now it's all gone. <laughs> How about now? We still can't see you, but we can hear you. We cannot right, see well, you, but we can hear you. I'll ask with my voice, and you can imagine my face. As Adrian just said, the visual representation is constructed internally anyway, so you can hold up a picture of me and imagine. So my question is kind of related to the, I'm trying to bridge from stuff that Conrad said last week to what you're saying, and this idea of low dimensional, or low dimensional models of what's going on. And so one could argue that there may not be a particularly low dimensional model characterizing the brain activity, kind of as you alluded to. Possibly there is a low dimensional model, however, corresponding to learning and development, which the argument is there's about 10,000 proteins involved in neurodevelopment and plasticity. And so that is the low dimensional model that corresponds to that. And we can certainly characterize that. I mean, it's only 10,000 dimensions. That's not such a big deal. And maybe we should really be investing our energy there rather than in this other thing, which may end up being a billion dimensional model and there's just, we'll never find it. So what do you think about that argument? Yeah, I guess it's, it's understanding of a different kind, right? So that, you know, Blake also, Richard also talks a lot about that, that, that maybe we just replace the whole idea of sort of trying to understand the dynamical structure with understanding the rules that you build it with, right? And to me, that I mean, that's that's an interesting perspective. But I think my picture you know, does not count that as understanding. I, you know, it, it fails to satisfy. And you know, maybe that is the only answer, and that's kind of depressing to me because I feel like that will not, um, you know, giving me the ingredients of an algorithm to build a solution is not the same as knowing what the solution is and does. And and I, you know, it's not that. It's not that I think it's wrong. It just um, makes me less interested in the answer. <laughs> See what I mean? I think we need to know those things. It's, it's vital, right? Because it's part of the answer, obviously. How, how do we get to the solution is via a very intricate set of, of, of rules that govern plasticity. But, um, but the, the answer is of a different type um, in terms of understanding. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, I, so part of my my anxiety, you know, <laughs> the sort of anxieties that keep us all awake. Um, it really goes back to when I when I first arrived at UW. You know, I, I went to a talk by um, a colleague of mine, whose name I've forgotten, and he was showing how how one could um, simulate the, the formation of, of um, oh, man, I've, my, I've forgotten all my words, but, um, uh, you know, when cells mitose, right? So you, you form the spindles and they, they push each other apart. And he had this amazing simulation where he'd only included like 10 different molecular components and simulated and it kind of self-organized and, and, and worked, right? So he, um, it, it really brought down to me, so what does it mean to understand the system is being able to simulate that with a, as few components as possible and, and get it approximately right. Is that, is that understanding, right? And in some sense, yes, right? You've identified what are the minimal a number of physical components that need to be there in order for it to work. But somehow it doesn't take me to the understanding that I'm sort of raised as a physicist to desire, right? The, the kind of, okay, you know, it's, it's, I can write it down as a, as a, as a model. And so it's the kind of the hands up and, you know, it, that might be the right answer, but it's not satisfying to me. You know, I just... So I, um, I thought maybe I would ask you something. Uh, it's a topic that a lot of us work on, some of us with um, single neuron recording, some of us with uh, population recording, some of us with modeling, some of us with reinforcement learning, some with representation learning. 
some with dynamical systems. And I, um, given your paper, I wonder what, how do you perceive of this field? Um, so there is the idea of place cells and grid cells, and there is the idea of place fields and grid fields. And there is the population idea, like those of Fuzi, which is uh, place codes, for instance, as opposed to necessarily being, a prop being in given cells. It seems like somehow, whatever phenomenon this is, at different levels, people are coming up with similar sort of uh, uh, insights, so to speak, based on different kinds of measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do wonder, um, how do you conceive of it, given that some aspects of it uh, seem to be in the receptive field category? Some of it, like the kind of computational work that we do, it turns out that we got very lucky in some mathematical properties explains place fields, and then their eigenvectors explain grid fields, and then the derivative of the multi-scale version of it gives distance to those cells. It turns out some very nice correspondence seems to be there between some cell properties and mathematical properties. But then how do you, what do you think of the uh, sort of the relationship between different le levels, your three cycle, I guess, uh, triangle? Uh, with regard to this concept, is it was it useful? The place cell people was it useful? Because even if it is true, as Fuzi is suggesting, that it's a population code and the place cells we are observing are a part of that, it still seems to give some insight about the bigger picture. Right. Yeah. No, that's a that's a great example where you know the slide of sort of uh, tuning curves are still useful, or at least they're still true. <laughs> so even if they're not useful they are an observable property of the neurons that you're looking at. And so if you've got your theory right, it still has to agree with the observation. Even if the observation is asking the wrong question, it's still a question that you can ask that system and the answers had better line up if you got it right. And so what adds beauty and elegance to that is when that emerges as the result of, of a higher level um, you know, thought process or model, such that it, it does line up and if you can add meaning to that right so uh, you know I, I think that that one of the struggles that many of us as physicists have have had with neuroscience is that is that there is meaning and that we are we're not really trained to to um you know physics doesn't mean anything <laughs> fundamentally right matter does stuff and you try to write down the best possible simplest model for it to that and that's where computer scientists psychologists you know come in is is interpreting that in terms of trying to actually do something or solve a problem or, or instantiate an algorithm and so you know the kind of work that you're you're thinking about really does you know bridge these different levels of what's it trying to do what's um you know a model that ex that, that that does that and what then would you expect to see if you went in and did the dumb you know tuning curve measurement and and it all lines up and that's very satisfying so do i understand correctly that given the right theoretical framework and multi-level framework uh, that can make predictions there's nothing wrong in, in principle with tuning curves but um, if it's considered as the only approach or right. if it may not, can it be claimed not where the point not necessarily right I, I you know i i take the point of people like romaine brad and others that you know, we overuse perhaps the the idea of, of neural coding, but it doesn't mean that the measurements that we make are wrong, right? They, we can still make those measurements and they're still meaningful. A neuron does fire reliably when something in the world happens. So our model had better account for that, right? It's, if it's, not, it's not a chaotic network that's just doing whatever it wants. It is correlated with stuff in the outside world. So we'd better get that part right, even if it's it's, only you know Plato's cave type thing. We're looking at a shadow of what's really happening. It's still a true shadow. So one more thing before we go to questions: uh, What do you think uh, with regards to normative as opposed to mechanistic models? So there are models that could say, "Hey, here are some pressures, and this is the way that the system adapted in order to represent something." and make certain kinds of predictions after that. So you can use the same parameters and say, all right, this is the normative explanation you give. Can you explain all these other things, 10 other things uh, using the same parameters? And then there is models that claim um, sort of particular implementation or mechanism. It could be at different levels, of course, doesn't need to be very detailed uh, the biophysics level. It can be at different levels of uh, mechanistic claims. 
So where where would they be um, in your triangle or uh, how do you- normative models help us, you know, build that computational framework. And then we would like our mechanistic models to show us how that might be implemented. So how do you fill in the computation box? That's the hard part of neuroscience, I think. You know, that's where we need interesting behavior. That's where we need creative thinking because that's not the part that just is a matter of taking lots of measurements or building my, you know, big biophysical model and just simulating it, right? It needs creativity and it needs needs deep thought. And so normative perspectives are one aspect of that. You know, I think one can overdo the idea that things are optimizing something, right? They may not be, but, and so normative, I think has this loadedness of, of it's about, you know, being best the best possible solution to a particular a particular problem. But at least it gives the some kind of framework for how you might go about building that algorithmic model. You know, so so you know, I think there's a very important role for that. And that's what theory is, right? Independent of measurement and observation. That's why we hope that there still are people kind of sitting at home and thinking <laughs> about what, what the model might be before before necessarily diving into the data to see what it does. And so the idea of automatic discovery, um, it, it's very rarely been true, right? That, that we've found things that we weren't looking for. You know, we, we, it's been super helpful many times to have the idea of a Rikard correlator or, you know, or efficient coding to understand what sort of experiments to do and how to interpret the data that we get out of it. And I think we still need to do that. So um, there are questions um, and Two have five votes, and I'm going to, just because Brad is one of us and has been doing a great job in the chat, and he has a five vote question. So Brad, as an honorary person in the room with us, even though we don't see your face, your question, um, I'll read it. Um, thinking about the paper, we are making decent progress in understanding, oops, where did Brad go? <laughs> Um, de uh, six now, decent progress in understanding the input output ends of the program, but the stuff in the middle is still hard to reach. What are good routes forward there? Because it seems like decoding approaches will have a lot of problems passing the properties of computation far away from the sensory motor end of things. So um, it's interesting, right? In other words, there are people who I call kind of deflationists, sensory motor deflationists, who think that we can study the sensory motor system and basically we'll get cognition through some sort of extrapolation at the end, um, through just, you know, from sensory motor circuits. Uh, and other people, <laughs> like me and maybe you, Ida, uh, think the cognition is going to need some extra source. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view, Adrian, of this? As, do you think that the further and further away you get from the sensory motor ends, as Brad's asking, that uh, it's going to get more difficult just going after decoding? Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it's it's sort of a triviality to say yes. Clearly, right? We when we know how to write down and calculate correlation functions between the known variables and and the complicated ones that we're measuring in the brain. The question is, can we see? Um, and that's I guess where we come back to the question of automated discovery. How do we see? cognition happening when there may not be an input or an output, right? I can do a lot of stuff without moving an inch or looking at anything. You know, we spend a lot of, well, hopefully some of us are spending a lot of time at the moment, <laughs> basically sitting in our chairs and thinking about stuff. And that is a huge part of, of humans, um, you know, that's, that's our life, you know? And so we better think about ways to, to be able to extract meaning and information from that. And it, it's obviously much harder. And I think that's where, you know, where some of these beautiful um, um, dimensionality reduction approaches, model finding approaches from, you know, from David Cicillo and, 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 um, and others have a lot of, a lot of value because they, hopefully can discover a sort of self-consistent structure that doesn't rely on a correlation with some with some external covariate. If we can't do it, we're gonna be gonna be in trouble. Right? But it, it's not clear that we're we're doing the right experiments at the moment to to get at that um, just yet. And it's 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 a very ambitious goal. Right? So I think there's it's probably not the first thing that we will solve in terms of cognition. I think there's there are 
cognitive questions that are driven by external you know contingencies is sort of Wisconsin counseling task type things where there are sophisticated and interesting questions to ask but there is some correlate in the outside world that we can track and time lock to that can make the problem a lot easier did not say anything deep there I think we would all say the same thing Um, so my, my connection is a little weak here. I'll see if I can I can talk. Um, with regards to you know it being difficult to use these techniques to get at things that are sort of farther inside away from the sensory motor ends, um, do you think that's just because you're farther away from the objective function that you can clearly measure, or do you think that perhaps those the stuff in there is just less tractable? Like I'm thinking, for example, of mixed selectivity cells. Right, this idea. That like in you know prefrontal cortex, you might have these cells that behave radically differently in different environments, you know. And of course, some people do find that like even in visual cortex, you find substantial variation across different contexts in terms of function. Um, but nevertheless, do you think there might be uh, sharp differences as you sort of get away in terms of the even just the possibility of using the same techniques if you have a crystal clear objective function as to what like the PFC was doing? But it just wouldn't be amenable to that kind of analysis. I'm not sure I I get how you're using the term objective function. Right? So so um, so objective function is meaning that on the motor end of things, right? You know exactly what the motor action was, and on the sensory side of things, you know exactly what the input was. So yeah. if you're trying to sort of represent those, sort of represent clear objective functions, right? Whereas for the PSD, it's less clear sort of what its input outputs are. Yeah, right. I mean, I think we're just coming back to point made earlier. I, I, I think when things are driven by the sensory input, they're pegged in a certain, you know, to a certain extent. Of course, there is all this blur coming back from the outside and cask modulation and attention modulation, lots of other stuff going on, you know, that I, we're all realizing, right, is makes that problem more complicated than we would like it to be. But um, what's going on in the in the middle, <laughs> I think, if we if we go back to the examples of of network um, models, right? P people buy you know other nineties or little um, Newsom type things. These types of of mixed representations are what's sort of dropping out of of that analysis. Right? They, they, lots of neurons are contributing to doing. In the more the more parts you want, more things you want that that network to do, the more different roles individual neurons uh, have to take. In that in that system, and so you know they're necessarily going to be um, a more complicated representation. And so you know that's where I think people are arguing with the idea of representation as even being the right the right way to think of it. It's you know sequential activation while the network is carrying out some you know time evolving process. And if you insist on correlating it with some moment in time, some particular task aspect, you will see that correlation because it's it's there, but it may not be the, the best, most efficient way to think about the computation that the network's doing. That, that makes sense. Um, I'm getting a little bit of echo at my end, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bow out. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, had, um, I had a couple questions. So I, I had one question about that initial triangle and bits and pieces of the answer, I think, were dropped throughout you know, some of the discussion so far. I was hoping to kind of accumulate it in one, one you know, or two sentences. Uh, where is the line between you know, low D models and high D data processing? It's really a lot of, you know, a lot of methods seem to be blurring that line and, you know, there's high dimensional models where you can intuit stuff and there's low dimensional models that seem abstract and useless. So where, yeah. you know, where is that? I guess, yeah, roughly speaking, the line is where you can understand it, right? So, you know, if you're trying to track all the variables in a ANN, you're not going to get anywhere, but if you projected onto into a low dimensional space where you can see it approaching an attractor, you know, that's low D enough to, to, to capture that that computational structure. So that leads nicely into my other question actually. Um, in terms of computation, there's two ways of thinking about it. There's kind of the physicist way of here's an attractor, it's a lovely attractor, 
I can look at it, I can quantify it, and it yields very beautiful uh, results. There's the other way of thinking about it, which is very you know computer oriented, which is here's an algorithm. It does a thing, and it does that thing sequentially through these steps. How do we bridge that? How do we go from, here's a bunch of attractors, and we know about it because we can say things about RNNs that are beautiful, to I am doing quick sort. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, so that in the very rough, you know, very quickly passing by you slide where where sort of there's the, out, the computation, we can instantiate it in data, we can instantiate it in our high D model, we can try and do a dimensional eye reduction that finds the same computational structure in terms of some kind of maybe a tractor system, because that's what physical systems do. Uh, how do you draw the line right between the algorithm and and that low D structure? And I, I think that that is, that is the question. <laughs> that's what we're all trying to do. You know, even something as simple as well trodden, right, as reinforcement learning, you know, where you've got all kinds of computations there of, of additions and subtractions and multiplications that have to happen in certain steps. How do you see that, right, in this in this computational structure? That's not um, not clear to me. So I think that there's uh, there's a lot of interesting work, and that's kind of what we're we're all trying to do. Thanks. I don't think it's the key question. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. Uh, fantastic to see you again. Amazing talk. Only you can pull off a talk with this much range and do it so gracefully. So it was a pleasure listening to you. Just um, showing it's really fast. That's the truth. <laughs> so I had a question for you. Um, what would a theory of the brain even look like? And would we know it if, we, if it got there, right? As lapsed physicists, we have this tendency to clear the deck and write the simplest possible thing. Will that do it, or is because biology is so gnarly, we're just going to find a pile of models? I feel like it's going to be a pile of models. You know, I I think a theory of the brain just can't can't be true, right? The brain is doing so many different things. Um, I would, I think, I hope that that most pieces of it will help us to understand why it uses the, the hardware it does. You know, I would like a theory of the brain to relate to the actual biology of the brain, that would be great. You know, why are granular cells different than cortical cells, different than the chemical cells, right? So that it would be, it would be very nice if, if our theories um, do end up incorporating that. But I, you know, we had a, I was at a workshop on this um, in Denmark last year, so what would a theory of the brain look like? And I really came away feeling that that it's going to be multiple overlaid systems. And I think that's OK. That's OK. Well, what if we said then, OK, you know, to, to borrow a page from, uh, from John's thinking, let's say we put behavior as a constraint. Do you think if I put in everything from your missing list, right, into a model that could then we could then use to find correlations in biological data, then would we get close to, let's say, a unifying theory of a behavior? Or is that too lofty as well? No, I fear not. <laughs> I'm, you know, I think I think John's point was totally valid. That you know, starting from something simple and adding in more and more detail as needed is a is a good way to go. And starting a priori with all those things um, is not going to lead us to the most parsimonious description. Right? And so, um, you know. I've, it's an endless debate and discussion about sort of what's the right level of description. They, you know, people like um, Anish Sahani would say, you know, we should, just shouldn't bother with even thinking at the single neuron level. All this is, you know, useless that we just should think about populations of neurons and how they interact. And that's certainly, from the neural network point of view, a supportable idea, right? We, you don't really care what's happening in individual neurons in a, in a neural Work, you just train them all up and then you look at the outputs and, and it does the right thing for you. But the, 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 the downside of that is then you lose your connection with your ability to control things. Right. That right. You really would like that. And I'm not saying that that's essential to a satisfactory theory of the brain. I would say it's essential to a theory of the brain that's useful for more than developing a general understanding. Right, that's useful for the ability to interact and to intervene. Right? Right. We, we care about it. 
So I was thinking about these ANN models, right? I mean, we build them, we design them, I mean, including me, right? We build them, design them to do something, and then we hope and pray we find a line attractor in state space. That's the game. Then you go, okay, so we can find line attractors for things for which you or, you know, physicists have come up with a computation in your box. But what about the general problem, right, of thinking and the types of problems that, you know, John and Ida work with? Mm -hmm. and we're clueless, right? What are we even looking for in this space? Right. Yeah, I think what, what the, the helpful aspect of neural network modeling is, is that it tells us how we don't know how to do that. Right? So what, how do you even set up the problem in the first place? And it, so I think it, it both gives us a tool, right, to do very concrete things, to say, okay, I've, I'm, I'm asking my network to do this task. What, what would we expect to see in the computation? Is that there in the data? But if we can't set up our neural network training algorithm to do that, <laughs> then we don't know we don't know what to look for. And so I think it, it's a way of testing intuition about about our, our level of understanding of even the question that we're trying to ask. So it's useful in that sense. If not, it's it's not necessarily a path to a solution. It's a path to testing intuition. I'm just gonna add one thing to it so that the you know, the, the 80s, 90s, and now re continuing uh, connectionist tradition uh, was indeed trying very hard to capture a particular, very specific idea. Like, for instance, think about this group task, mm -hmm. some very clear behavior, and then design an architecture, a neural network that could show how that can be solved. And then you could show that if you perturb particular parts of this network, you will also see pathologies that look like pathologies humans would show when their behavior gets disrupted, right? So I think that the, uh, the, there was a tradition before the new surge in um, neural networks due to better computational capacities and independent of the kind of uh, uh, RNNs and sort of physicists uh, approaches to theoretical neuroscience that was working at the cognitive level. And there was, uh, I think, um, um, Someone referred to it as the West Coast approach because a lot of them were at the time uh, in the West Coast during the 80s and 90s, and then they moved around. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's important to notice that. And I think currently that cognitive neural network approach is also seeing a boost because you have people like Matt Bosbinick at DeepMind, you have, you know, Randy O'Reilly writing a paper with Benjo saying the deep learning needs to the frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. uh, you have someone like Benji being very interested in reading cognitive theories. You have some of the, their papers coming out talking about schemata and object files and things that were very much in the cognitive science and not at all close to anything that has to do with neurons. So I think that it's important to also notice that it's, um, neural networks have been used in, in, in theoretically elucidating higher level cognition as well. It's just yeah, a good thing. Yeah, you know, to some extent, the the work that's going on in natural language processing is a similar story there, right? So we used to pause everything and, and do linguistics and then turns out you can do it um, through statistical learning, but that you need certain architectures in order to, to make that work. And so there's certainly understanding that is arising from out of this, this interplay. Yeah, I, I like your point very much, Ida, that it should not be this East Coast, West Coast, like feel at all. I mean, if we're all after, on, you know, after the understanding of this, then we need to be working together, which I think is also Adrian's point. Well, it is no longer just West Coast, right? That, that was back then where Fodor, Pinker, uh, Chomsky, the people who were against the connectionists, they were in the East Coast. And like, you know, I think that this was in um, Paul Smolensky's talk at uh, Microsoft Research, where he divided this into the, he called it East Pole and the West Coast approaches uh, between the two, the innate and language oriented, and then what them up sort of connection is that yeah. It's kind of funny because it's what happened in rap, right? They also had this East Coast West Coast divide. So. And then we won. <laughs> So um, in terms of other questions in the question box, um, there were two with four. I'm trying to pick the one that's closest, to, uh, furthest away, I mean, from ones you've already on. So there's, this is the old Marian saw of, do we need to imitate, understand a bird in order to understand aerodynamic theory? Maybe a normative model 
gives rise to a better understanding rather than a mechanistic one. <clears throat> so if we know what it is that should be done, we might come up with different, maybe even more efficient ways to do it. So I assume that sort of saying that maybe if we had a normative theory of cognition, we could bypass the brain altogether and just build a better cognitive system. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I think we're already doing that, right? We have neural networks for face recognition that are better than we are. And so I think we, there are ways that we have figured out how to do problems using using computational algorithms that are that are better than the brain. But um, then we, again, we're sort of getting back to to this picture that that one wants to define the algorithm, and then you want to to understand. You would like to understand how it's how it's implemented in some kind of human readable terms, right? So, is a is a huge network implementation a human readable? Term? You know, maybe more. You know, as time goes by, as we get better intuition about about under you know about how they how they function and how they work, and there's a lot of great work going on to to do exactly that. So, maybe this dichotomy between sort of the high dimensional model and low dimensional model will kind of go away as we as we get better at, at just conceptualizing high dimensional models. I think that's that's entirely entirely possible. So the question uh, oh I, I was just gonna say that the question asker uh, and I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna let you say say your name because uh, <laughs> um, but maybe you would like to sort of respond to Adrian and how do you say your name? So I, I want to see whether I was got, would have gotten it right. So first of all hi thanks for the fantastic talk. Oh, I'm Amir Reza. Amir Reza. So that's okay. Amir Reza, yeah. Yeah, Far okay. Pasha, I'm from Iran. Uh, so there's a thing that, yes, we might need that mechanistic approach to, you know, kind of get into what, what, is it, what is that should be done. But there's a thing that we might never be able to understand that perfectly because, you know, we have in, in every single synapse, we have all those chemicals and stuff. But we do have... Uh, a grasp on cognition, we do have a grasp on psychology. We know in a large scale that what is it that a uh, being is doing. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can break that down in a, you know, in a way to minimal stuff that is giving rise to that big picture. And from there, you know, pick up uh, normative stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's totally reasonable to dedicate one's own career, right, to doing not the whole thing, right, to, to saying, okay, I, I would be comfortable with a description that just dealt with behavior. You know, if I could do a million experiments and, and build myself a, a normative model or reward, and that explained 90% of the variance that I see in my rodent or my human, you know, that's a very that's satisfying career, right? That I, I think as a community, we would like to fill in all the boxes. So, so you know, that work would form a great framework for someone else to say, well, it's amazing how well your model works and you even get the error, you know, the style of the errors right. And so presumably that, now it gives me something to look for, right? Now I'm gonna look for a correlate that does what your model does. And where is that? Is that in prefrontal cortex? Is that in you know, basal ganglia, where is that? And so, I, you know, I think that's exactly the kind of, um, you know, high level theoretical work that, that I think is critical. And, you know, that, that John and others have, have argued for is to, is to work at that level, develop those, um, you know, those interpretive algorithms that then give a basis for us to search through, through data and see if we can see correlates. And also just, you know, um, to get to Kanaka's question and then Adrian, your email to me about what will we need in terms of missing data and tools for a theory of the brain. I do worry sometimes that when we talk about a theory of the brain, I guess the way people say theory of gravity, I wonder that it, it is it a real question? In other words, yes, you can end up with something like minimized free energy, but I find that so abstract yeah. that it doesn't distinguish between, a, as I've said before, a bacterium and a brain. So it gets, it's so abstract that it doesn't actually do the work at the level of the differences we care about. Right. And that, but I, so I wonder whether a theory of the brain is like saying, 
John, do you have a theory of New York City? What does that actually mean? Do you have a theory of New York City? No. So in other words, is, is this just sentences being uttered in English that are just getting us into trouble because it, it just doesn't, a theory of New York City, I, I, I don't know what that would mean, right? A theory of cities, okay, maybe, but in the end what's gonna happen is you're gonna have explanatory pieces for each aspect, cultural New York, political New York, mm -hmm. who knows? Um, the so will, will have meaning, will have meaning, right? Pieces that you can pull off and say, okay, you know, what's a good way to build a subway system, right? Here's a few different examples. Here's the common principles that underlie that good design. And you know, what people seem to have, you know, engineers seem to have done is try to minimize the, the path length and, and make access to the maximum number of people, right? So I think that there, there's, there's room for sub theories you know, within the functioning of a very complex organism, but it won't there, you know, I think Kranika's question was exactly right. Will there be a theory of the brain? I don't think so. I think it'll be, there are things that one can, can theorize, right? And, uh, and have been done successfully. I think, yeah. John, I think your question really highlights a current limitation maybe in the field. Like, you know that Twitter account that just adds in mice at the end of every title? if they actually did it in mice because the the title is like brains love cocaine or whatever but like they only studied it in mice um, <laughs> and it's the same thing like theory of the brain even in my papers i often will write them and i go back and whenever i write the connectome i have to change it to a connectome because there's not the connectome there's not even a connectome of a person at a time it depends on the scale and what counts as an edge and what counts as a node and we're pretty imprecise, I'd say, as a community about what we mean. The theory of the brain is the most abstract and imprecise thing you can possibly say. Um, but it, it happens at all, you know, sort no, of- No, I just, I, I just get some cognitive dissonance when you see people saying that our best chance of having a theory of the brain, as you just said, an incredibly abstract claim, is to get really particular in the details, right? It, there seems to me, a uh, a contradiction inherent in the idea that by getting into the nitty gritty and ever more granular, you're going to come up with the ultimate generalization. And I just find that absurd. What people say, though, they don't say, you know, I am measuring from glia because I know that this will give me the better. Theory. Actually, I can give you because I'm, pre and I'm preparing. You know, everyone says that. That's what Conrad taught me was the Mott Bailey doctrine, where people say outrageous things and then when you get them in a conference or on the screen oh no one ever meant that but actually i can give you quote after quote after quote I from history of neuroscience and from websites and from papers that make yeah. exactly the claim that i'm saying mm -hmm. okay so in other words i'm, I'm not going to be fooled by the mott bailey move which is that no one actually ever said that because every grant says something like that Right now, whether that's just an inherent understanding that we all have to bullshit our way to grant funding and paper acceptance. But I do think that there's some people who feel that the more granular the get you get, the more abstract the conclusions that you can get to. And I find that, for me at least, unconvincing. But I think it's something that we have to grapple with rather than say no one actually believes that. Yeah, so let's let's just ask ourselves why we're ever you know recording details from the brain and part of it is that they're there and they matter right you before your glia die you're gonna not function super well right so they're clearly playing some role and i think from the point of view even of people trying to understand general intelligence there is the hope right that there's some glimmer of of understanding that's buried in all that detail that's going to show us, um, you know, new dimensions that we need to incorporate or that will help us to do things. And and I I, I think that's that's very likely, right? That that uh, neural network structures right now are are at least let's take neural network structures ten years ago, right before LSTM, say they did a lot of stuff, but they were limited in some ways. So then you add new components into them that are capturing some aspect in many cases of what really does have a brain to make it come with and return. So there's yet more layers of richness that the brain suggests to us that may well help us to 
build more, um, you know, powerful devices. But even without the the, the motivation, sorry, thirty years old, thank you. <laughs> so even without the motivation of, of you know aiming toward general intelligence we do want to understand why the brain is built the way it is and what roles different aspects of the biology are playing in the computations that our brains can do. And so it does, you know, clearly there is a level beyond which we're not gaining, but, but you know, what is that, right? So, you know, my favorite kinds of you know, things I used to do a lot of is looking at all the ion channels in an individual neuron. If you want to understand how one neuron transforms its inputs to outputs, um, you could write down, you know, 16 differential equations, or you could just look at the, at the filter, right? That, 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 that is the net result of all of those things. And maybe that's what we need, right? We need this sort of compact description that's kind of a functional description that captures all the interesting things that that all this complex biology is giving. And ultimately, to me, that's how we move in the direction of understanding. That would be the low dimensional model, right? That, that has captured all of the interesting stuff that all of those um, sort of unseen mini dimensional dynamics are, are providing to our system. And hopefully we'll capture it in a way that expresses its computational function. You always look so juvenile. Uh, I could never just make you look happy. <laughs> John, you're muted. I, ju I, I just find that I have in order to, a genuine, you know, why is this so difficult? And, and also I, I have trouble knowing that to understand upwards, we should be digging downwards. And I, I find know. myself, no, I know you're not saying that. I'm just saying that there's, I, I wish it worked, yeah. right? And otherwise, and, and, and I wonder why it isn't. Yeah. I don't want to stop people from doing it, right? Because I think it will help us understand. And I, what, you know, the, the, I think the mantra should be that, you know, let many flowers bloom. I, I think that, that we, as a field, we tend to run after trends, right? And so everyone's kind of heading out one way. Hang on, you know, there's lots of other stuff that probably matters. And an insightful person working on that may be able to help us turn that into meaning that we can, can incorporate in this in this bigger picture so I, I think it's just i just want to see diversity of thought and diversity of approaches and open-mindedness right about the way people approach the field um questions um i'm trying to be maximally uh, in the uh, with a couple of them uh So I, have, I have a question for John, thinking for the next one. Maybe maybe this will be really short and simple. You, you've mentioned a few times, Adrian, artificial neural networks and big artificial neural networks and LSTMs. And I wonder, do you think they're a good model of the brain today, like the current technology? Or do you think that they could be in the future, given suitable advances that we haven't figured out yet? Or are they just whatever, another tool that we're going to use as a nonlinear function approximator? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think that they have been useful in helping us to, even as a tool to say, all right, I have a system that does this task. What data analysis should I do on it right, to understand what it did? So in, even in that sense, I think they have been useful. Whether the thing that you now trained is stands on its own as a good model of the brain, um, you have to ask yourself in what sense, right? So if my job, uh, in understanding to build another thing that does the same thing as my brain, um, yeah, they could be a good model. But if we mean by model, something that basically does it in a similar way that my brain does it, and then allows me to go into the brain and make perturbations that, that will make, you know, that I can make predictions about, then I'm, I'm more dubious about that. I, I, I feel like they're the you know the the substrates are so um different right and and all of this chemical slop and you know even the fact that we're we're so influenced right by mood and by by you know the environment and by th that are changing our, our computations continuously and we we don't put any we don't have any model of that yet in in artificial systems 
So there are two questions that are sort of similar. Um, one says that dreaded word for neuroscientists, uh, isn't it better to look for emergence, in other words, scale separation? And then a similar question above it, I think, which is, is it reasonable or fruitful to expect that brain function can be explained using simpler primitives? So I think they're basically asking the same question, which is, if you have these emergent phenomena at higher levels of interaction and organization, how can you possibly reverse engineer those things by looking at simpler bits? <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a, that is a great question. Um, I think it's, okay, there's, there's two, sort of two ways to, to answer that. So one is that if we are to understand it, it had better be low dimensional, right? There'd better be some kind of implementation that is emergent, right? That is to say that that has kind of global or, or macroscopic features that are that are somewhat independent of, of the lower level, right? Because without that property, um, we will not understand it. It will be just some incredibly complex thing that, that there is no root, right, to understanding, at least in the way I think that understanding. That, you know, that, that one says that in order to build those complex features at a high level, you can do that mechanistically without having the interactions that exist at the low level. And so maybe there's a role for people to figure out, you know, what those mechanisms of interaction are at the low level that lead to that higher level. You know, so for, I mean, that's just one very concrete example, right? Are we going to understand cognition by only looking at neural activity or do we also need to keep track, right, of the chemical bath, right, in which things are living? Now we're able to measure concentrations of um, you know, dopamine, other things, right? That's, there are many other variables, right, that are also going on at the same time. We've chosen to focus on neural firing. Is that enough to be able to, to understand what's going on? And maybe it is, right? Maybe you only ever need to, to watch um, even a fraction of the cells that are firing. If things are sort of intrinsically low enough dimensional, you could choose some small subset of the of the possible observables and that will give you um, the information that you need to say decode whether you know decode the algorithm whether or not that tells you how the the, the system is implementing that algorithm is is very unclear so i think i think maybe we're we're all sort of falling into there being two types of explanation one in which one explains the algorithm and and some literature way how it's implemented the other is what are the key um, biological mechanisms by which those low dimensional um, structures are produced which can be really different things so oh. theory could apply right to either of them there are theories of cell division there are theories of you know neuroplasticity it's a different kind of theory than the ones i think that we're all in this room sort of interested in, but they they are still, you know, valid <laughs> as a theory. So we're reaching the 90 minute mark. Um, I wonder whether there are any sort of final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with. And just to cue you for that, um, my guess is that your answer to the question do we need to understand from the bottom up everything in order to understand the brain is no um, um which is but something don't, that's not know it either <laughs> <laughs> don't completely forget about it there may be super important riches there to to mine to to cover some of the you know the ignorance that we have right now and i i would really encourage a lot of you to go back and read and um, the original the brain 2025 report just to remind yourself how far we have to go, right, in, in doing the, in solving the problems that the field want us to, to solve. And I, sometimes it feels like a, quite a weight to be a theorist, right? There's, there's really, you know, it, you can, not you can always, but it's getting easier and easier. I'd say to stick a neuropixels probe into a brain and get great data, but, you know, and then they say, okay, theorist, you know, <laughs> what's it all about? <laughs> That's hard. And so I think we we do need, fresh, cool, interesting new ideas about about theories. And there's certainly lots of space still for that sort of top T, you know, big T theory to help us figure out what's going on there. 
I think the beauty of looking at the, you know, more seriously at the biology, I've, I've been really floored by the extent to which, you know, when people are putting in these neuroprotective it's this immensely correlated activity. No one expected that, right? If you really had tuning curves, you wouldn't see the whole brain kind of lighting up together. That's a disaster for neural coding theory. So we have lots of really important new questions to, to address, thanks what, to the data. And what do you think are the three more most promising t big T theories for the next 10 years? Oh, that's so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Five years. Uh, okay, learning is, yeah, I mean, we have to figure out learning theory. I mean, I, I threw out control theory. I mean, that's not a theory of anything. It's a method, right, for how to, how to um, do things, but I think we definitely um, have a lot of a lot of space there in figuring out how to use control theoretic and advanced control theoretic um, ideas into these more nonlinear frameworks in order to be able to test our ideas about perturbation. So if everything is sort of low dimensional dynamical systems, that you know that's that's um, a, a comprehensible and controllable system in principle. And then we can see if we're going off the rails by not taking into account all the variables that we're not we're not currently measuring. So, so I, Adrian, so given your, and you know, you are an unusual position, right? In other words, you actually get to circulate through, you know, the methodologists, you know, the, the connectomists, you know, the theorists, uh, and you've worked yourself all the way down at the level of single neurons. Uh, are you Are you optimistic? I mean, do you feel... Everyone talks about AI winters. Uh, God forbid again that one would invoke a neuroscience winter. Do, are you optimistic? Do you feel like it's, because I sometimes feel these conversations, you know, take on a particular flavor. There are obviously additions, especially when the people are in a position like you are, but it still feels a little bit like there's something missing. So I find the glass to be half empty <laughs> what do you think? I mean, I'm just interested. I, I, yeah. I mean, am I just, is it just my temperament that I'm just a moody, or is it? Do you still feel, despite everywhere that I you've do been, feel optimistic. I think we have. There's so much great work that's been done in the last in the last five years, and I completely get you that you know it's great work, but so what's the where's the meat, right? So where what is the the thing we can say that we now understand that's really moved us along, and I. I think if you thought one thought carefully and took time, one could frame that, right? I think that we are uh, have moved into an era where we're. I think we all all these ideas that were out there for a long time um, are now kind of mainstream, right? That things are kind of low dimensional, that they or or you know they may not even be that low dimensional, but that is a, a productive way of trying to isolate specific computations in the chaos of very high dimensional neural networks, right? That that's productive and can can carry us forward. And so when you say that, so would you say then, you know, the kind of work being done by people like, you know, Tim Barron, Stefano Fusi and others who are exactly. working, uh, working as sort of multi-dimensional state spaces, dynamical systems and relating it back to some neural, you know, specific, yeah. specifics like grid cells and d d d does that, so I guess, do you feel that those are not just examples of cool little islands of fact that we should appreciate for being a nice island to visit or are they actually turning into a continent? Are they actually giving us a framework that will spread and is new? Do, 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 so is it island or continent in your view? Because we're hearing a lot about it, right? It's, it's continent. You know, I think that these, um, you know, statistical inference techniques are have advanced a lot and they're super powerful and people are figuring out how to use them in, in useful ways. And so that's that's huge events and I'm I'm very excited about that. I think that that will take us a long way. You know, we we have to figure out how to put it all together and our, our experiments are still, you know, we're still looking through pinholes, but you know, but eventually I think we, we're starting to have the kinds of tools that that let us extract truly rich and useful information from those experiments along with the, along with the advantage of course in the, in the recording technology. So yeah, I, I, I my, the only time I get really depressed is talking to my husband, bless you know, so <laughs> <laughs> generally but about, about these things because, you know, we, 
that what we were saying before about Google being able to build the you know, huger huger models and they kind of do what we do, maybe sometimes better. And is there a theory, right, that's useful or interesting there? And sometimes it feels like, no, yeah, probably not, right? There's just a lot of little tricks to help train the networks well. And and that that is when I start to feel uh, on board, right, from the kinds of things that I would like to do you know, in my scientific career. And so do I want to just train huger and huger networks that do better and better in some tasks? Not really, right? So I guess part of my mantra here of so let's look at the details and understand them is because that feels like science to me. You know, that's I feel like I'm back on science grounds where where I, I can ask a real question of what did this you know ion channel do to the computation and you know there's a there's an answer to that um, so I'm maybe it, it, yeah it, it it's interesting in the in the uh, in the um in cobb's history of the brain book which came out earlier this year which I, I think i've tweeted about um you know he writes about the past the present and the future and he says something very much like you did which is as soon as it starts getting AI flavored and moves away from substrate, and you're talking about derived things from populations, it feels like it's going away from biological science. And he, in the end of his book, goes back to saying, maybe we should study insects and yeah. invertebrates <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and have the wiring diagram. And, you know, yeah. there's this, there is this feeling like yours, which, uh, Maybe yeah. we should use our amazing tools and study maggots, is what he studies. He studies maggots. I guess it's um, not and, so much you know, we, right? That's where I don't want to be prescriptive. You know, I just think there are some of us, myself included, who whose view of science is not really doing that stuff, right? And there are plenty of people who love that, and you're all great, and I admire you, and I, it's not really what I want to do with my life. And no, so, no, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to. I, I agree. It's not a value judgment. I think it's something that this, this salon is going to deal with is that despite obviously we believe in pluralism and we believe that everyone should do work and talk like we are, it's interesting that there is this feeling that something for some people feels more like science than others, yeah. right? Prediction versus understanding, biological substrate by non. And it's just interesting to see, even though you're right there in the heart of the beast, not yeah. Les, but you know what I mean, um, uh, and, and still thinking that it doesn't feel quite like science. I think it's just extremely interesting. I think that's something that's gonna come up over and over again in this salon is this and it might be generational too i think you know many people maybe five ten years younger than me were sort of brought up with in this paradigm and that's what you know science has always been for them that you know I right think. Mm -hmm. also the distinction between science and engineering can be relatively blurry like are we reverse yeah. engineering the brain or are we trying to understand the brain and you know in, in my department of biomedical engineering there's lots of people who could just as easily be in neuroscience, and people in the neuroscience department at Hopkins could easily be in biomedical engineering. It's just, it's, it's a different approach, and it goes back to some of the stuff Adrian was saying earlier, like there's a dynamical systems approach, there's a mechanistic approach, there's latent variable modeling approaches, and it's all, you know, it takes all kinds, I think is the point. And it's not at all clear who's gonna win. Uh, and that goes back to something that, John, you said last week, which is, there are all these different people taking totally different complementary approaches to the brain. And some of us are betting a lot on trying to see like actually the bio stuff, like what's actually in there. And a lot of people are totally ignoring that and having a very successful career, talking about lots of things that are incredibly insightful and interesting. And ideally, I think part of the salon is to bring those people together. Yeah, I agree. We hope that we can keep away from terminology like win. <laughs> yes, that's so. You know, terminology like what? Win? Win. Oh. You, know, I, you know, things will do well, and I, I agree with you that one can, um, you know, you can do build decoders, and probably, you know, this, you know, Elon Musk company will do amazing things. But, but there will be other people that will contribute to a to a more fundamental understanding of what's going on there that that may not be captured by by the ability to simply translate into motor output. Or so I, you know, I, I think we don't want to say one approach is going to win. I think that I think we want to listen to each other and and you know. But but, but Adrian, I, I, but Adrian, I would say that the, on, on the one hand, you you gracefully said we shouldn't say win, and then you said one is more fundamental than the other, which is a disguised way of saying that it's.
closer to the truth than the other, which is a kind of winning. Well, in your in your um, aesthetic view of what it means to win, John, because if you know one could more build fundamental a is a value judgment. Works really well, and not give a damn about that. But you know, who cares about you academics and your ivory towers trying to figure out fundamental mechanism? Look at my amazing right BCI. So I won if I'm the BCI guy. So I, I, I think I think we've got to be careful, right, about <laughs> just. There is no, there is no win here. There is, there is progress in many different directions. And right, but it, it may well be that coming back to your paper where you talk about physics, right? And I think you make a point. And of course, there's a whole tradition and Bill Bayek and everyone coming from physics into neuroscience. Um, but David Bohm, right, the physicist who goes a little bit unappreciated. Um, sort of makes a point in one of his books that one of the interesting things is that there probably is no fundamental level that the one thing that maybe we're going to have to deal with is that there's no such thing as a fundamental level and that there may be when it comes to systems like the brain, you just have to accept that there are going to be many and it depends how you frame your question, what the answer will be. So maybe it's not about biology being more fundamental than computer science. It may be that they're genuinely equally fundamental, except when you need to fix it. Yeah, right. No, I, that, I think that's a great point. I think also, I mean, I agree, maybe no one will win, but I mean, I just kind of highlighting this, it's kind of like evolution. No species wins, but lots of species lose. They, yeah. they go extinct and they die and that's the end. And so it, it could be that certain approaches to investigating the brain will die. Yes. And right. you know, a good example of that maybe is, is uh, phrenology. Mm. They did not win. Um, well, let's look in 20 years' time and see if connectomics ends up being one of those that survive. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe the shorter, yeah, maybe the shorter way that I was mentioning it in the chat is, uh, it's maybe you're right that there is no win, but there is definitely the notion of failure, and some theories will be falsified, and some claims that do, some some claims that oh, we can build bottom up, simulate an entire brain, those will fail as well. So I think that. It, it's important to notice that, all right, maybe maybe let's not talk about win, but at some point we will have falsified a lot of the approaches. It would have, um, although as, as in the case of neural networks, they might return after a while <laughs> when we are more ready for them. Yeah, I, I, I think one can falsify a theory, but not necessarily falsify an approach. You know, there are approaches that are more or less useful and they will compete and, and some will, you know, become more central because they are they yield more. Right? I, I think if, I, I'd rather think about it that way. I think there will be ideas and about how things work that rightly fall away. But you know, I would I don't want to see the end of biophysical modeling, for example. I mean, I, I, how one invests in different scales of that, I think, is up for debate. But but I do think there's important stuff to be learned there. And, and I think for that, I mean, there are 542 people on at the moment, Adrian, and I think the, the one thing that, that if there were a fundamental level and you felt like you were working at that fundamental level, then you could feel that no matter what your question, whether you're interested in various aspects of cognition or sensation or movement, that at least because you're working at the fundamental level, you're going to get insights because it's, you have the the benefit of working at the area that's most likely to answer anything that you ask. And I think that's the, the concern I have, is that people come into a field very interested in psychological concepts, and then they feel, well, because I'm working at the level of biophysics and circuits, I'm always going to get my cake and eat it because I'm existing at the current notion of what's fundamental. And I think that's the concern, that if we really did believe that there were many different levels that are equally fundamental, then people would feel a little more comfortable going in at the cognitive level right to get at the get-go rather than thinking they have to go via what is currently the fundamental zeitgeist, right? Yeah. So I think that's my concern. The question really more about uh, there are two ways that what you're talking about is important. One is what comfort one feels about one's own work and the motivation that you have to do the things that you do. And if that is based on deciding it's fundamental or not, then that will govern that. I think the more salient issue is whether it's influencing the way grants and are funded and papers are published. 
And, you know, there is where value judgments are, are dangerous, right? Or, or start to be difficult or, or shape people's, people's careers. You know, I, having come into this field from outside, I don't think I do have a pre-existing bias on what is fundamental. And I, I, I think we, you know, the, the fact that this field is, is being, um, you know, run by or, or participated in by people coming from computer science, physics, biology, genetics, you know, engineering means that there is no agreed upon fundamental level. So I'm, you know, I think, I think we should all be respectful, right? As just, as I said before. Right. Um, and it's, it's just because your paper was really interesting is that you got quite biophysical and mm -hmm. then you got very computational. So you basically were in a way, like Ida asked, suggesting a way forward which is you can be both abstract but be grounded in biophysics yeah, yeah, that's and I, what i like to do i try to bridge levels and yeah and, uh, yeah yeah well okay um if anyone else in the chat or in the questions or obviously brad kanaka ida or josh have a a closing question or statement um well, maybe let some of these people who may be in Europe go to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining. This very fun. Thanks um, Amy, for answering all of our questions and spending your time with us. And hopefully, you can breathe well in Seattle and the fire don't get up there. Another couple of days before we get fresh air. Bye, cool. Adrian. Yeah, all right. Uh, say hi to Blaz. We'll do. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being here. And thank you, Kanaka and Brad. Thanks, Kanaka and Brad. Thank you, guys. Bye.